Okay, we continue our Calculus 3 series with video number two on vectors. Now you should have encountered the idea of vectors in your previous classes, maybe just briefly, but essentially a vector represents a quantity that has both direction and magnitude. Now some things or some quantities are easily represented by the more familiar scalars, like real numbers. So for example, if you're measuring someone's height, Maybe you'd say they're six feet tall. You don't need a vector quantity to describe that. There's no direction attached to it. Or if you're just counting things, you might say, I have four jelly beans. Or if you're measuring the volume of some quantity, you would say, okay, it's three meters cubed, but you wouldn't include a direction. So other quantities contain more information, both a size and a direction. So for example, say you're talking about the velocity of some object, right? Well, the size or the magnitude would be the speed of it, so 50 miles per hour. And then the direction, you would say, oh, we're traveling 50 miles per hour north. So as soon as I attach that quantity north, now I have a vector quantity. Other examples of quantities that are described using vectors are things like displacement, force, etc. Okay, now vectors can be represented a variety of ways and they're often represented using directed line segments, basically what you would think of as arrows. And the length represents the magnitude of the vector which points in a direction. And vectors u and w are said to be equal, shown here, here's vectors u and w, we say that they're equal because they have the same magnitude, they have the same length, and they have the same direction, even though they're in different locations. So even though the initial point, right, here's the initial point for each vector, is in a different position, the terminal point in relationship to it is maintaining that same direction and magnitude. In fact, vector u could be said to be all directed line segments or vectors with this magnitude and direction regardless of their locations, regardless of where that initial point is. So since the location of a vector is not significant, we're free to pick them up and move them around as long as we don't change their magnitude or their direction. And most often, we relocate our vectors so that their initial point is at the origin. And then we would use the coordinates of the terminal point to describe our vector. And that's just the easiest, most natural way to describe them. Anytime we do this, this representation is called the position vector. Okay, so position vector means the initial point is at the origin. And then if the terminal point is at a comma b, then we represent the vector by using the following notation, a b. Okay. So consider the vector 3, negative 1, sketch this position vector, and then on the same axis graph the vector BC with initial point B, 2, 1, and terminal point C, 5, 0. Caution, CB has different direction, yes. And then verify that these vectors are equal. Okay, so first we're going to sketch the vector 3, negative 1. It's a position vector, I know that because of the way that it's written. And it told me so in the problem. So here we go. Um, now, I'm just going to, this is in two space, so I have my y-axis, x-axis. And the terminal point is at 3, negative 1. Yes? So here's 3, negative 1. Here's my vector. Okay. And then on the same axis, they're asking me to graph vector BC. And vector BC has initial point 2, 1 and terminal point 5, 0. Okay, so let me extend my axis a little bit actually. So we can go all the way to 5. So if that's 3, here's 4, 5. And initial point for B is 2, comma 1. So 2, 1 would be here. And then terminal point is 5, 0. So this is vector BC. Okay. 
Now, be careful, CB has different direction, right? You want the initial and terminal points to correspond. Now, graphically, it makes sense, right, that these are equal, but how would you verify it algebraically? Well, how would I write BC as a position vector? Well, you would take the terminal point minus the initial point for vector BC, and then I could write it as a position vector. So what do I mean? Well, the terminal point was at 5, 0, right? And the initial point is at 2, 1. So I could write vector BC with the following components, 5 minus 2 and 0 minus 1, and then I get 3, negative 1. So I've algebraically also verified that these vectors are equal, okay? Good. Now we've mentioned the idea of magnitude, that it describes the length, right, or size of a vector, but we want a more precise definition. So we said the magnitude of vector v with components a1 and a2 is given by the following. So the magnitude of v, or you could write it with what looks like double absolute value bars, is equal to the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared, if the components are a1 and a2. And then similarly, the magnitude of a vector in three space w with components a1, a2, a3, again, you could write that as magnitude of w with one set of vertical bars around it, or two, magnitude of w, and that's gonna be the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared, all right? Good. So now let's look at an example here. Find the magnitude of vector v with components 1, 2, 3. So the magnitude of v is going to be equal to the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. So that's going to be rad 1 plus 4 plus 9, which is rad 14. Okay, nice. Moving on, definition, the zero vector. The zero vector we express either as a zero with vector symbol above it, and in two space, it would be the vector with zero, zero as its components, or in three space, it would have component zero, zero, zero. So just some facts about the zero vector, its magnitude is zero. length is zero and it has all directions it takes on all directions we'll discuss why in more detail later using some definitions now as a note of caution the zero vector is not equal to zero the scalar okay so a lot of the time, you have to be really careful. Anytime you're describing a vector quantity, you need to put the symbol up above it so that we know you were dealing with a vector. When you're reading a math book and it's typed, a lot of the time they'll use bold face print, right, to represent a vector. Sometimes you'll see that they'll actually draw a little arrow up above using vector notation, but the, we're not going to write in bold face on our paper, so you need to make sure you put that arrow up above anytime you're working with a vector quantity. Okay, now how do we add vectors? First, let's talk about geometrically how we would do it, and then we'll look at algebraically. So say you have two vectors, A and B. If I want to find their sum, one way I can do so is by using the triangle rule. And when you use the triangle rule, you add them tip to tail, meaning you take vector A, and then you're going to add vector B, and the initial point of V, B, excuse me, has to start or connect with the terminal point of A. Okay, and then if you take the initial point of A and you connect it all the way to the end of the terminal point of B, <clears throat> that vector A plus B is the sum. Another method that you could use is the parallelogram rule. So notice in the parallelogram rule, this time the initial points coincide, right? I'm not adding them tip to tail. So here's vector A, here's vector B. What do you do? Well, it's called the parallelogram rule because guess what? You make a parallelogram. So you copy vector A on the opposite side, and then this is going to be vector B again. Ooh, that doesn't look good. Let's make it beautiful. There we go. Much better. That's vector B. And then the diagonal of the parallelogram 
is the sum of the two vectors. So this would be a plus b. Okay, now that's geometrically. We're not gonna do that too often. It's not difficult to verify that when vectors are represented using components, they can be added simply by adding corresponding components. So say vector u has components u1 and u2, and then vector v has components v1 and v2, then u plus v is just gonna be the sum of the x components, so u1 plus v1, and then the second component I would find by summing up u2 and v2, okay? And this can be verified geometrically. So say you had vector u, maybe it's going this way. This is my vector u. And then if I were to break it up into components, right, that's the vertical component. So that would be u2, that's u1. And then say I have vector v that I'm gonna add to it. Here's vector v. And then here's its horizontal component, so that's V1. Here's the vertical component, V2. And then the sum of these two vectors would be, since I added them tip to tail, this resultant here, this would be U plus V. And notice, if I were to break this up, U plus V, into components, you could see here, okay, here's the vertical component, and then here's the horizontal component. That was a little too much. Okay, let's draw the horizontal component first so you can see clearly. And then here's the vertical component. I'm gonna zoom in. So notice I have V2 and U2. Since U2 is negative, V2 plus U2 gives me this vertical component here. And then U1 plus V1 corresponds with the horizontal component here, U1 plus V1, okay? Good, I'm not gonna draw you the similar diagram in three dimensions, but the definition naturally extends, okay? So you could add the components for the third um, dimension as well. Now vectors can also be multiplied by scalars. So consider the vector U shown below. What would you expect the vector 3u to represent? Well, what do we know about multiplication? We know that it's repeated addition. So basically 3u would mean you have u plus u plus u or triple that original vector. So if you were to graph it, what would you expect? Well, I would expect, say this is vector u, 3u would look like three times the length So the magnitude would triple, but the direction would be the same, right? Isn't that what you would expect? So this is 3u right here. Now, what does it imply about scalar multiplication of vectors using components? Well, since we have the same direction, that means the ratio, right, of those components must remain intact. It's only three times the magnitude. That's what changed. So how would you algebraically perform scalar multiplication? Well, if I have three times my vector u, that means I have three times vector u. Let's say it has components u1, u2. I would just distribute that through 3u1. 3u2. If you're multiplying a vector by a scalar, you just distribute it through to the components. Now, we're asked to find the magnitude of 3u. So let's go ahead and do that. So the magnitude of 3u is going to be the square root of 9u1 squared plus 9u2 squared. And then I can factor out that 9, actually. And I have u1 squared plus u2 squared square root of nine, that's three. And then notice, if I have the square root of u1 squared plus u2 squared, that's just the magnitude of u. Okay, which is what we expected, right? The magnitude of three u is three times the magnitude of our original vector u. 
Now, what is negative 3u? Sketch it. Then write it in component form. So it would just have the opposite direction, yes? And now we're asked to sketch it. Okay. Do I still have this guy? Sure, I do. Let's paste it three times. But since I want to change the direction, I'm going to switch which way the arrow is pointing. Okay. So I'm going to get rid of this. And now the initial point is going to be the terminal point of 3u. And the terminal point is the initial point. So now it's going to go this way. So this is negative 3u. Okay, initial point here, terminal point here. Write it in component form. Okay, no problem. So negative 3u would be negative 3u1 and negative 3u2. Okay. Now, the vectors u, 3u, and negative 3u are all said to be parallel. And that makes sense to us geometrically. We, we have little sketches of these vectors here. But what's a more formal definition if we wanted to check without graphing? So we say that two vectors a and b are parallel if there is a scalar. So remember, a scalar is just a real number. C, such that... B is equal to C times A. So basically, they're scalar multiples of each other. So what do I mean by that? So for example, we would say the vectors 4, negative 2, 5, and 2, negative 1, 7 are not parallel. Right? They're not scalar multiples of each other. Maybe you thought they were going to be, right? 7 ruined it for everybody. So what would they need to be um, so that they were parallel? If I switched it around, right? So if I had 4, let's do 4, negative 2, 5. And 2, negative 1, 5 halves. Then yes, those are parallel. Okay? So we can see that they're scalar multiples of each other. All right, now that we've defined negative scalar multiples of vectors, we can define vector subtraction. So u minus v is um, defined to be u plus the opposite of v, okay? Now there's several ways this can be represented geometrically. So if we have two vectors, a and b, and I wanna find a minus b, remember I could think of this as a, plus the opposite of b, right? So if I want to subtract these two vectors, I could add tip to tail. So the opposite of b would just point in the other direction. So now I would switch it so that the initial point would be here, and then the terminal point would go the opposite way. That would be the opposite of b. And then a plus the opposite of b, or a minus b would be the resultant here. So that's one way that you could find the subtraction. Another way is to make use of the fact that b plus a minus b gives us a. So what does that mean? I mean, if you look at this expression right here, algebraically it makes sense, right? b plus a minus b just gives us back a. Well, here's b, here's vector a. They're not being added tip to tail. But if I take b and here's some unknown vector, right? This is unknown vector. Who is this? B plus that unknown vector gives me back vector A. And algebraically, we know that that means this vector here must be A minus B. So this is the triangle method, and it's pretty easy if you just line up the initial points and then connect the two vectors. But just make sure that you keep the order of subtraction in mind. So wherever the initial point is here, right? Since that comes from vector B, that's the one that's negative. And then wherever it terminates on that vector A, that's the one that's positive. Okay. And then vector subtraction using component form is done the obvious way. You just subtract the components. Nothing fancy. Now there's still a number of important properties of vectors. And while they may seem, seem obvious, they're still important and useful. Make sure that you look them over. So vector addition is commutative. We have um, the associative property, property two, 
the identity operator a plus the zero vector gives us back a. Um, the additive inverse a plus the opposite of a is the zero vector. Here we have distributive property of a scalar across vector addition. And then also you can distribute a sum of scalars across a vector. And we have community pro commutative property of multiplication if you have two scalars with a vector and then identity um, operator for multiplication. Okay, so let's just practice applying some of these. So given vector a and b, find 3a minus 4b. Okay, so 3a, I'm just going to multiply all the components by 3. So the components are going to be 9, 6, negative 3. And then I'm going to subtract 4b. So multiply all the components by 4. That's going to be 0, 24, and 28. And then I'm going to subtract the components corresponding order. So I have 9 minus 0, 6 minus 24, that's negative 18. And then negative 3 minus 28, that's negative 30. All right, lovely. Now, next idea are unit vectors. Often, we're going to need to find a unit vector and some properties or definitions about what a unit vector is. So it's a vector whose magnitude is one. Magnitude or length is one. And then if you have a vector V, and it's not necessarily a unit vector, but you want a unit vector in the same direction, what would you do? Well, you would scale it down. You would take the magnitude of V and divide all of the components of V by it, right? Or another way that we would say it is V divided by magnitude of V. And this is something you're gonna to need to do frequently throughout this course. So you'll be given a vector, but you're gonna to wanna to work with a unit vector that has the same direction. So in order to do that, you're just gonna divide all of the components by the magnitude of the vector. So let's practice, since we're gonna do it so much. So find a unit vector in the direction of W whose components are five, four, one. So first I need the magnitude of W. So magnitude of W, is equal to the square root of 25 plus 16 plus 1. So that's going to be rad 42. Okay, so the unit vector, I'll call it u. It would be 1 over rad 42 times 5 for 1. Or I could distribute it through. So I'd have 5 over rad 42, 4 over rad 42 and 1 over rad 42. Okay, whether or not you distribute the 1 over rad 42 through really depends on the context of the problem. So you'll see throughout the semester, sometimes you want to hold off on doing that step until a little bit later, or other times you want to distribute it through right away. So it'll just depend, okay? All right, now the vectors, I'm going to say i hat, j hat, k hat, because when you read them printed in bold, um, you don't see that, but when you write them out by hand, you have to put little hats on them. You'll see what I mean. Now, these are special unit vectors whose directions coincide with the directions of the coordinate axes. So i hat is the unit vector 1, 0, 0. So its direction corresponds with the direction of the positive x-axis. j hat, similarly, has components 0, 1, 0. And then k hat has components 0, 0, 1. Okay, so make sure you put those little hats on them. When you're reading math and it's typed, it, it'll just be bold face usually. Now what this does is it provides us with an alternate method for representing vectors using components. So instead of writing the vector above as 5, 4, 1, I could express it as 5i hat plus 4j hat plus 1k hat. Okay, and you're going to need to know how to use um, both representations of a vector, it really depends on the context of what we're doing in the problem, whether one notation is preferred over another, although most of the time I really won't care which one you use. Okay, now vectors are extremely useful in many applications from physics. So for the most part, we're just going to leave these applications to your physics courses. However, the following example is the one type that we will explore in the class, and it has to do with static equilibrium, okay? So we have ropes that are three meters and five meters in length, and they're fastened to a holiday decoration that's suspended over a town square. The decoration has a mass of five kilograms. Now these ropes are fastened at different heights, and they make angles of 52 degrees and 40 degrees with the horizontal. 
find the tension in each rope and the magnitude of each tension. So tension is a vector quantity, okay? And what we're gonna have to do is first draw a little diagram. If you're in a physics course, probably call it a free body diagram. We're not gonna be that specific about how we draw things here, but just something to orient us um, and give us some context to the problem. So we have this holiday decoration that's hanging. I'll just use a triangle to represent it. And it's fastened to two ropes, but they're um, different lengths and at different heights. So here's one of the ropes and say the other one's over here. Okay, so they're fastened to who knows what at different heights and it's hanging. And they make angles of 52 degrees and 40 degrees with the horizontal. Okay, so if this is 40 degrees, this is 52 degrees. Now let's think about what forces are being exerted. Well, the decoration is exerting a downward force, right? And that force is the force due to gravity. So mass of the decoration times acceleration due to gravity. Well, the mass of the decoration is five kilograms. Acceleration due to gravity is gonna be negative because it's pointing downward. So we're gonna use negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is gonna be negative 49 newtons, okay? Now, tension in each of the ropes points away, right? So I have tension one here, tension two here. Now, since the holiday decoration is not moving, it's this uh, scenario described is in static equilibrium. What does that mean? Well, that means that the sum of the forces in the horizontal direction from the tension in the ropes as well as the decoration must be zero, and then the sum of the forces in the vertical direction must also be zero. Okay, so now let's write out the vectors for T1 and T2. Now, Vector T1, the horizontal component, if I were to break it down, like here's T1. I'm just going to draw a little diagram here. So I want the horizontal component, and then I want the vertical component, yes? Vertical component, horizontal component. If this is 52 degrees, this is also 52 degrees, okay? Now, I could figure out 180 minus 52, or I can just slap a negative on there for the horizontal component. So it's going to be negative magnitude of T1 times cosine of 52 would give me the horizontal component. And then the vertical component, that's pointing upwards, so that's going to be magnitude of T1 sine of 52 degrees. Okay, now for vector T2, similarly, horizontal component going to be this way. That's the horizontal component. And then there's the vertical component. So horizontal component is going to be magnitude of T2 times cosine of 40, right? This is also 40 degrees in here. And then vertical component is going to be magnitude of T2 times sine of 40 degrees. Okay. And then last vector I have is from the decoration that's hanging, horizontal component zero, and then we calculated vertical component is gonna be negative 49, okay? Now I know that the sum of the forces in the horizontal direction is gonna be zero, so that means negative magnitude T1 cosine 52 plus magnitude T2 cosine 40 has to equal zero, right? So I'm just summing up all of the horizontal components. And then similarly, the sum of the vertical components also must be zero. So I have magnitude of T1 sine 52 plus magnitude T2 sine of 40 minus 49 equals zero. Okay, now look here. I have a system of two equations with two unknowns. I'm solving for the magnitude of T1 and the magnitude of T2. So easiest way to do that is I'm going to solve for, let's solve for T1. It doesn't matter, either T1 or T2 in the first equation and substitute it into the second equation. So from here I have that the magnitude of T1 is going to equal the magnitude of T2 cosine 40 divided by cosine 52. 
and then I can substitute that in for T1 into this equation here. So now I'm gonna have magnitude of T2, cosine 40, sine 52, divided by cosine 52, plus magnitude T2, sine of 40, and then let's just move that 49 over to the other side, so equals 49. Now I can solve for T2, I'm just gonna factor it out here. So I have magnitude of T2 times, now look, I can rewrite this as tangent 42, yes? So I, I mean 52, so I have tangent of 52 times cosine of 40 plus sine of 40. All of that is equal to 49. And then that means the magnitude of T2 is equal to 49 divided by all of that stuff. So tangent 52, cosine 40, plus sine 40. Leave it all in your calculator like that. Okay. And then we're just going to round to the nearest whole number. So this is going to be approximately 30 newtons and then similarly i can solve for the magnitude of t1 up above so since i have the magnitude of t2 now and don't use your rounded answer yes you all know better so if you're solving for a magnitude of t1 where you have magnitude of t2 you're going to substitute in this whole expression into your calculator and then multiply by cosine 40 divide by cosine 52. So we'll just cut to the chase. Magnitude of T1 comes out to be approximately 38 newtons. Okay. Now be careful. Notice what the problem was asking for. A lot of students won't catch this. Find the tension in each rope and the magnitude of each tension. Well, we found the magnitude of each tension right now, right? but I didn't find the tension in each rope. What does that mean? Well, tension is a vector quantity. So I need to express T1 and T2 as vectors in component form, okay? So since I have the magnitude of each one of them now, I can do that pretty easily. So vector T1 is gonna be negative 38 cosine 52 degrees and 38 sine 52 degrees, which is approximately, we're just gonna round to the nearest whole number, negative 23 and 30. And then vector T2 is equal to 30 cosine 40 degrees and 30 sine 40 degrees, which is approximately 23 and 19. And we do expect the horizontal components to be opposites of each other, right? Since we know that the decoration had zero for its horizontal components and if the sum of the forces is gonna be zero in either direction, then that should also cancel each other out. So that concludes that example. Ooh, and let's box our final answer proudly. It looks beautiful. And stay tuned. We have more fun with the vectors to come.